And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast. Rise up, rise up, rise up. and welcome once again to the Midnight Ride. My name is David Carrico and it is my great honor to be here in the Puritan Barn in the Now You See TV studios with my co-host John Pounders. Tonight we have a very, very profound Midnight Ride. It's called the Simulation Theory Decoded for the Bible. It's going to be absolutely cutting edge as the Midnight Ride has a tendency to be. So we want you to sit back, relax. This will be a Calgon take me away unto the third heaven show here on the Midnight Ride. So get ready. The ride starts right now because we are right now. Tonight we're going to be talking about the simulation hypothesis or simulation theory as it's called depending on on who you hear speak on this subject. And the idea behind the simulation hypothesis or theory is the uh, that we are living in a simulation in something that is unrecognizable as a simulation for us uh, to us it all seems very real but we are living in a simulation and there is a programmer at the top of this and um, everything that we do is basically monitored by this code maker and we um, or or code makers, whoever they may be, and we are living in a alternate or, fi- or a basically a recreated reality. So this is the this is the whole thing behind this. This is the theory, and we're going to talk a little bit about the theory, show you the theory, and show you what it talks about in scripture and why um, scientists may not be able to accept our um, thoughts on this method. Because you know it's easy to look into things based upon. Um, their reality but based upon what the word of god says uh, there's another reality and and so when we look at these things we can look at them in the light of god's word and that really gives us an edge i think i think it gives us an edge to understanding what this is because most scientists philosophers have never really been able to pinpoint that now i want to make the make the claim for sure that i do not believe that i that I know everything for sure. I feel like the more I learn, the less that I obviously know um, in in life because history has changed on many things. There's a lot of things that we can't get access to information on. Uh, But these are quotes from some of the top uh, people that have talked about this. And, of course, there's books about it that have been uh, written, top-selling books. Uh, But this is a quote from Elon Musk. It says, there's a one in a billion chance we are not living in a simulation Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson says, I find it hard to argue we are not in a simulation. And uh, this is in the book, The Simulation Hypothesis, which is a, uh, if you're going to research about this subject and from a gamer's point of view, again, not necessarily a gamer, but a game creator created some of the most popular games in the world. And we'll talk a little bit about um, what he believes there. So David, I'm going to go and I'm going to I have a video that has uh, Tyson and Musk uh, talking about these theories. But before we go to that, did you have anything you want to add to uh, talking about this theory? Well, I think we might rightly call this the top of the food chain of science falsely so-called. And this is theory. And this is what science falsely so-called is. There's a legitimate science that's provable through the legitimate scientific method, but we have the theory of evolution. We have the theory of heliocentricity. We have the theory of quantum physics. We have string theory, big bang theory, da-da-da-da-da. And all of this is premised upon the fact 
that there is no God and that the Bible is not true. This is the top of the food chain of the wisdom of the world without God. And, and it, the thing about it, too, is it's so easy to believe because there's some major uh, truths within this theory oh, that, yeah. that make sense because uh, some of the truths within this are, are in fact, biblical truths, right? But yeah. there's also yeah. some things that they're unable to accept about this theory, I believe, based on their idea yeah. of evolution. It's deeply compelling to the carnal mind, and sci-fi has been all over this for many years. Yeah, and, and you know, stay tuned and listen for about this theory because when you when you actually look at it, to me, it kind of strengthened my faith in general in our Creator. It, it strengthened um, everything about the relationship that I have with Him, and so hopefully, people will get that out of this, uh, like I did, because this is this is um, to me it was it was great, and to me, I think it also is foundational in understanding what we may have to experience in the future and what this could possibly mean to us right now there's there's you know several uh things that are a side effect of this being a possibility so um in the future so especially there's but one in play a this zillion video here. real universe and 999 bazillion to one that That's you are a simulation simulation uh, that convinced me and, and i don't want to be convinced i didn't like it and i was just begging for somebody to to give me an argument that was cogent enough to undermine that entire reasoning, and I just came across it. Uh oh. Who? Okay. Okay. It's a good friend of mine, Rich Gott. All right. Uh, he was a, a colleague of mine back when I was at Princeton. All right. Uh, deep thinker, likes calculating the ends of things. Nice. With, with Bayesian statistics. He's heavily quoted in this book, The Doomsday Calculation, and William Poundstone is a smart guy unto himself, and I am now convinced. Now you're convinced. Are you ready? Okay, okay. go ahead. What do all these. Un so here is what convinced me we're not in a. Simulation. Okay. Are you seated? All right. I'm seated. Are you put it? Hold on. I'm going to hold. Okay. <laughs> all right. What do all those simulated universes have in common? They're simulations. They can. They have the power to simulate That's themselves. That's what I'm saying. They're simulations. No, they have the power to simulate themselves. Right. Oh, okay. Uh, yes. That's they, what they all they have in common. Make a simulation. They have so, that power right. exactly to simulate themselves exactly. What, do we have that power now? No, we don't. No, we don't. Which means that we can't send it. In, we can't send ourselves into the future as a simulation because so we, we don't have the power yet. So we can't continue the chain. Wait, so either we, we are, are the, the real one, right, or we're the one in the chain that's still evolving to try so, to then make a simulation within their own world, right? So the odds of us being a simulation goes from a gazillion to one. I mean, from, to, to, to the likelihood of the a, 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 right. All right. it flips. It flips 50-50. Wow. And I'm good with that. This could be some simulation. It could. Do you entertain that? Well, the argument for the simulation, I think, is quite strong. Because if you assume any improvement at all over time, any improvement, 1%, 0.1%, just extend the time frame, make it a thousand years, a million years, the universe is 13.8 billion years old. What would what, civilization, if you counted, if you're very generous, civilization is maybe seven or eight thousand years old, if you counted from the first writing. This is nothing. This is nothing. Um, so, if you assume any rate of improvement at all, then games will be indistinguishable from reality. Or civilization will end. One of those two things will occur. Therefore, Ultimately. we are most likely in a simulation. Or okay. we're on our we way exist. to one, right? Well, but just Since because we exist, we, exist we, we could most certainly be on the road. We could be on the road to that, right? It doesn't mean that it has to have already happened. It could be in base reality. It could be in base reality. We could be here now on our way to the road or on our way to the destination where this can never happen again where we are completely ingrained in some sort of an artificial technology or some sort of a symbiotic relationship with the Internet or the next level of uh, sharing information. But right now we're not there yet. That's possible too, right? It's possible that a simulation is one day going to be inevitable, that we're going to have something that's indistinguishable from regular reality. But maybe we're not there yet. That's also possible. That we're not yes, quite there yet. That This is real? When I touch that it feels wood, very real. 
So you have these two guys talking about this, and, and really at some point they have to kind of give give the chance that we are not there yet. And really the whole theory is based on the idea that we are heading to that point. And I'll explain kind of where that, why they believe we're actually in one right now, even though we haven't made it to that point here in a minute. But this is where this whole thing's predicated on. But all of them have to give the, the um, at least the thought that we are that base civilization that hasn't head, headed toward that yet, which is what I believe. I believe we are uh, the civilization that was created that is not there yet to this point. And I think there's been a couple times in, in history, I would would say, that have um, that has been shut down. Something like that's been shut down. One we see with the flood, uh, the others we see with Babylon. So did you have anything you wanted to comment on about what they said? Well, it's uh, it, it's really amazing that the carnal mind of man can come up with all these things. It's just got to be driven by an evil entity. And all of these simulations, they admit to be self-creating, like there's an AI behind it that is the creating a world that is self-creating and self-perpetuating. And it's either that or it's God. And uh, they can't admit that God is real and the creator, because the minute they do, their theories are just shown to be what they are utter nonsense and the ravings of a dark carnal mind so and and that's that's so true and what i would submit to you about their theory that the most thing wrong about their theory is the idea that we're in a recreation not the actual creation right so they believe we're in a simulated reality we believe we are in a actual reality okay a real reality made by the creator and really those two things are blurry lines to these people because they can't admit like 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 David said they can't admit that there's a creator because if they do as you'll see as we continue they will have to admit that there's somebody that knows everything that they've ever done and that there might come a time when all that stuff is brought before them and and as we continue this theory to me there's more of a probability that that's the truth uh, no matter if you believe the Bible or not than the than the the idea that it is uh, we're in a reality right now. Uh, at all so that's what we're going to talk about here we're going to go through some things that um, discuss this concept and what scientists are saying about the idea that um, there is some sort of creator out there and this this is what this next video is about so here we go actually i'm sorry the video is not yet i want to explain who's in the video first david uh, chalmers this guy is a philosopher and cognitive scientist uh, he has a lot of credentials, obviously, but he gives a talk about this theory, and I think it's worth uh, seeing what he had to say about it. And then we have uh, Rizwan Verk, which is a um, video game maker, and he also wrote uh, one of the main books on this subject uh, that I think uh, he did a did a really good job from the secular point of view on this subject. He, he did a Google talk, and we're going to see a portion of of his Google talk on here so we can kind of see what they say about the idea that we are created. And uh, we'll, then we'll discuss this, David. I mean, it does have some interesting consequences if we live in a simulation. It turns out, for example, that maybe we have, maybe the simulation was created. Who created the simulation? Well, it was the programmer in the next universe up. Um, maybe this programmer could be considered to be a god of our world. Um, another big question is what's outside the simulation, right? Elon Musk asked this recently as well. He said that, uh, I think Lex Fridman, um, researcher at MIT, asked him, what would you ask an AGI? if we had artificial general intelligence. He said, I would ask him, what's outside the simulation, <laughs> right? Is it aliens, future humans? So Bostrom's theory was that we live inside an ancestor simulation. So there are future versions of us, and this is more, more along the lines of what Philip K. Dick believed. Could they be time travelers? If you're more of a religious man, you might think it's God and angels. Some people think it's pure consciousness, going back to Max Planck and some of the ideas there. We don't know the answer, but you know, what does this mean for me right, as a person? 
So, David, do you have anything to say to that when you when you were, I saw you writing something down? But, you know, the, what I gathered from this idea is they they have to at least look into the the idea that there is a creator behind this. Yeah. And when we're going to, they say simulation, but let's say creation, you know, because it is what it is. It's a creation. Um, what did you think about that? Well, believe it or not, when I was listening to David Chalmers, talk about you know who's the creator well it's some man the next level up that's doing the programming this is very very virtually identical to the thought of mormonism yeah now what mormons believe old joel smith and Brigham, is that god was a man from the planet kolob that cohabitated with a woman and created this world and if you are you know, true to the Mormon faith, go through temple and everything, that you will one day start your own world, just like God started this world. If, and you become the programmer, if you will, for your world. It's the same concept that the creator is some man on the next level up. I never thought of that before, but this is exactly uh, the thinking that is there within Mormonism. I agree, and it's also kind of the, the story played out in, in uh, Gnosticism. You know, you have yeah. the Demiurge, and you have all yeah. the different uh, beings that can reproduce themselves over and over again and do all this. It's kind of the same line of thought, but on a more, you know, different terminology, yeah. I guess you could say. It's on a scientific level. They're just putting the scientific dress, uh, and always, you know, the scientists have been the priest in the New World Order, but it's uh, it's devilishly clever. Yeah, I mean, it, it's to a point to where um, this this has gone back. I mean, I believe, and we're gonna. T I'll talk more about it in a minute. But I believe this this actually goes back to the original uh, deception of man being becoming a god. You know, this is yeah. this is the ancient deception uh, that we'll talk about was entered in at some point here in a minute. But that's that's yeah. what it is. Yeah. So I'm going to go over this next thing right here. So I'm going to kind of give you guys an idea of, and, and I hope to explain it because I, I listen to a lot of these guys speak and they, and some of them are great at speaking. Some of them, not so much. Some of them are so smart, but have a really, really hard time relaying the information to people. And so I created this uh, little video to kind of help explain um, what it is and be able to put it in terms that's easier to understand. I'm not saying that, you know, I'm, I'm putting it in layman's terms. I'm not just saying that. I'm saying put it in terms that when you look at it, you can kind of see what what is being said here. So um, basically what we have is this idea that this Big Bang occurred. And then we have billions and billions and billions and billions and billions and billions of years up to a certain point. And during that billions and billions of years, you have civilizations and universes that created, that did their thing. And they did all these things, and then uh, they created little uh, sim sim worlds that are all over the place. And then after that, uh, after that, billions and billions and billions of years, you have us cropping up on the earth, uh, going from a little thing to a lizard to a monkey to a human to a caveman, and then um, that is where we're at. Now, the reason they feel like there's a billion to one chance that we are in a simulation is because of the th the belief that there are other civilizations that are more advanced than we are. And, and so they have to believe that that's a possibility based on the idea that there are other civilizations more advanced than us. So um, those two things allow, I believe, make the, make the ideas skewed on it and especially not wanting to entertain the biblical method for speaking on this subject. Yeah, and all of these theories are intertwined, and probably the easiest one for Christians to see is evolution. The extent that they have gone to put evolution and virtually ban anyone from the academic community that would teach against it. But all of these theories are reinforcing in that the basic premise behind them all is that God doesn't exist. It's some man on the next level. It's some... Uh, AI, something that is other than God, that's the premise of all that they do. And all of these interlaced theories, uh, they're all through academia, and they'll all bring you to the same point. There is no God but man. Exactly. And that's, and that's the, the problem I have mainly with the, with the theory, because I do believe we're in a creative reality. No, I, I truly believe that. I believe that we are in a creative reality, that we don't understand 
the reality that God lives in. We don't understand the time frame that he lives in. We don't understand how time operates in that frame. We don't understand how anything works in that time period. All we can really study and understand are things that work within the reality that we've been given to understand. Yeah. And so we'll, we'll dig into that. So, you know, saying that, there's, I've got this picture here of a man and his dog. And one of the best analogies I can think of to showing how little we possibly can understand as human beings is by this a picture like this because a dog can get so close to its owner it can get close it can be the the owner can love it more than it loves a human uh, the owner can love this little dog and pet this dog and be as close to the dog as it possibly can the dog could really follow this human around everywhere it goes but this dog will never fully understand what this human being goes through it'll never understand the actions that it's taking to get what it needs it'll never truly understand really much at all about the human other than it loves it with all its heart and it will do anything for it and it's happy to see it every time it comes through and this is the way i look at our relationship mm -hmm. with the most high god we are like that dog that we can get close to him and he can get close to us and he can love us but we can never really truly understand everything that he is in this reality that we have been given what, what would you say to that david i think that's just a perfect analogy it's yeah. just a perfect analogy. Yeah, and so in the scripture, we kind of have some of that stuff, you know, being talked about. In Isaiah 55, verses 8 through 9, it says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And in 1 Corinthians 8, 2, we see, And if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet, as he ought to know. And I think the scripture is very clear too on the idea of, um, you know, other reality that we can't see here on earth. And, and one of the stories that comes to mind, David, is when um, Elijah and Elisha were at this, at this uh, battle and there was armies surrounding their camp. And Elisha was coming to tell Elijah about it. And Elijah said, you know, fear not, there's more of us than there are of them. And he, he asked that God opened up Elisha's eyes. And when he did, Elisha saw that there were an army of angels surrounding uh, the camp. He saw that they were on their side ready to go to battle for him. And he was able to open the eyes of men to see that as well. To other men, Elisha was able to open up the eyes of other men as he went down uh, to do so. And they saw this reality that they could not naturally see inside um in, in what they were able to be able to apprehend, I guess not apprehend, but able to be able to perceive. They couldn't perceive what was actually in front of them for who knows what reason, but the the facts remain is that these entities that were doing battle were unable to be seen by the average human. That's, I mean, that's a fact. Yeah. Yeah. And in Scripture, the Bible calls Jesus the true light in John chapter 1 and verse 9. And that word in the Greek, alethanos, means that which is true over against that which is false and an imitation of the true. And we have had created for us a matrix, if you will, a 501c3 simulation of what truth should be. And everything, uh, this is just so imposed upon people's minds. There's so many things they believe that are false because this is the false reality that is being created for them. And only by realizing that in Jesus and in the word of God is true, can people prevent that false matrix being imposed in their minds rather than the truth. I mean, that's exactly truth. I mean, there has to be a way to battle this because everything, every information we get from the humanist world, uh, like you said, is, 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 uh, coordinated. It's not, um, anything other than coordinated and we have to look at it and understand it in that light. I mean, yeah, there's just no other way around it. Yeah. And we know who the real programmer behind it is. It's Satan himself. Yeah. He's, sure. he's the programmer here. And the Bible definitely backs that up. Um, and I want to go to some scripture here to talk about why we believe what we believe. Because basically, like I said before, the simulation theory, um, I would call it a creation reality. This is, this is I would rephrase, re retame this and, and look at it in the scriptures about what the scripture says. And in the scripture here, um, in Genesis chapter 1, verses 1, everybody knows the scripture. In the beginning, 
God created the heaven and the earth. And of course, um, you know, this is one of those things that we can look at in the scripture and be, if we believe the scripture, we can be sure about this notion of things. You know, uh, people say, well, it takes a lot of faith to believe that, but it takes a lot of faith to believe in a big bang and billions of billions of years and, and coming to the place that we are at now. It, it takes much, much faith. I mean, if you look at something as simple as a clock, you see this clock and you see how it works. You see the mass machinery. You see the way it's built. You see the, the way it's put together. And you would never look at that clock and think this thing just evolved into something amazing. You would know that there was a clockmaker. There was a person that sent, spent their time uh, designing the pieces that fit that clock to make it work properly. And so Romans 1 talks about looking at creation. It's, it's proof of itself. You can see it in creation. And we know scientists have gone down to the smallest atom trying to get down and figure out what our creation is all about. And in Genesis 127, it says, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Now, the, the scientists would say that, um, you know, if we are living in a simulation that the programmer programmed us, and he um, designed us in a way uh, to live and design this simulation to play out, and in the Bible, we see that God made man in his own image, and he did this, and he put them in a reality. We know well, the reality is the Garden of Eden that he put it, put us in, inside an enclosed world. We know that this is the reality of what the, the scriptures has to say about God's creation and, um, and who we are. And David, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Well, I could, and it, this is something that we can see the flip side of this. Uh, with Albert Pike, and have you mentioned that this is very much in line with Gnostic thought and with Masonic thought, which is just the same as Gnostic, but this is what Albert Pike said on page 652 of Morals and Dogma. The real reality is, as you have put forth there in Genesis 127, God creating man in his own image, Albert Pike said God was first recognized in the heavenly bodies and in the elements when man's consciousness of his own intellectuality was matured and he became convinced that the internal faculty of thought was something more subtle than even the most subtle elements. He transferred that new conception to the object of his worship and deified a mental principle instead of of a physical one. And that's exactly what these people are doing. They are deifying their carnal minds rather than submitting to the Creator. He goes on to say, He in every case makes God after His own image. This is exactly what we're talking about. Exactly. I mean, there that is a profound statement. And Albert Pike was a smart man. No doubt about oh, it. I was. mean, he was he was a man that was given to humanism, as far as I can tell, the Freemasonry, um, this Gnostic idea. Really, it goes back to a Kabbalistic mindset and, and and thought on all of this. I mean, if you really, we we were talking about this earlier. How you know when you look at this theory, evolution, uh, seven root races, uh, all the theosophical arguments, they all fit together nicely in a little vase. You know, it's like if a vase got dropped. And you took all those pieces and put it together. They fit together so so wonderfully into a doctrine, and um, that it is very deceptive doctrine to those, especially oh, yeah. to those that are super smart. I mean, thank uh, you know, thank God I'm not as smart as some of these people out there, right? I, I think that sometimes this this ability to be so smart brings so much pride into a person's heart and so much um, evil really into to what how they how they play their life out. I, I think, yeah. And the idea that God is the creator of a real, tangible universe, and he's the moral governor of the world. And in their world, in the satanic simulation, there is no morality. It is a self-perpetuating uh, simulation that doesn't depend on man being good or obedient because we're, they're just in some kind of a simulation, and morality is immaterial to the ultimate outcome. Yeah. And I would argue, too, though, that even if they believe that, guess what? There's somebody that knows everything you've done, buddy, and we're going to talk about that, and we're going to talk about why that matters, why it does matter, and yeah. how, it, how we can prove that there's somebody that literally knows every move we've made and all-knowing 
uh, being, which uh, is something that they don't want to admit either. But if this theory is true uh, in any way, shape or form, then it is the obvious uh, thing that you have to point out. And so we're going to look at this. We're going to look into DNA here. We're going to look into uh, decoding DNA and what this DNA is, what this uh, bit of information that we all have in our body that makes up who we are, uh, what this DNA is, why do people want to look into it, and why do people want to change it? I mean, we have this is a this is a really popular thing today to be able to change DNA. We have the CRISPR Cas technology that the whole goal in that is to be able to edit. DNA uh, to pass on to future generations. You know, this is this is a virus, so to say, that is put into the DNA to change the program, the outcome, and it's not the the creator that wanted to change this outcome. So we look in the DNA, and um, when you look at the strands, it's it's they in a computer language. And it's not necessarily a computer language, but it is. It can be edited like a computer language, and it kind of becomes one once they put it in to the way that they uh, are able to decipher it and um this is what bill gates had to say about dna dna is like a computer program but far far more advanced than any software ever created now bill gates as you know is as windows right he created windows a, a computer programmer so when he looks at these things when he looks at this this dna he sees a computer program that's far far more advanced than anything that's been ever created and i would agree with him that it is far more advanced than yeah. any program that's ever been able to be created in yeah. fact people are still trying to unravel it still trying to use this technology in order to manipulate it and uh, and i think with his new vaccine he 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 is uh, he has some interesting things going on with this that that people should look into see what it do, trying to do to our uh, bodies here but we we have one thing that i want to talk about and i want to get your comment on this and because we've talked about this uh many times i think before but we have this thing called epigenetics, and epigenetics basically take every action that you do, your the diet you have, your psychological state, your social interactions, uh, the alternative medicine you take, the therapeutic drugs, everything you eat, your exercise, your financial status, what kind of a drug abuse or any kind of other abuse, exposure to disease, and seasonal correlations. It takes all of these things into account all the time. It's always collecting information. And it's taking this information and adding it to the genome. It's adding it to the DNA strand. Now, when you look at the idea of a simulation, a computer program, this is, this is um, it, if, if we look at the idea of we're in a reality, we are in a reality created by God, our DNA is literally recording everything that we do. Everything that we do can be seen and called back forth, and, and our bodies can be called back forth because we have we are programmed. That we have the life is in the blood. The Scripture speaks about these things that we have this within us. So everything that we do can be accounted for by the Most High God, which is how He can rightfully and righteously judge the nations, in my opinion. And and I think uh, Bible well, we're going to see that the Bible backs that up. But David, did you have anything you wanted to add? Well, both there's so many things on the table here. And one thought that comes to mind is that which was said about Nimrod, that he began to be a mighty one, a Gibberim. He was not born a Gibberim, but he became one, a mighty man. And uh, the word, the first use of the word Gibberim in Bible is Genesis chapter 6, where the giants became mighty men, Gibberim upon the earth. So... There are things that people can do to change their genetics, and even just sinful behavior can change your genetics at a germline level. And this is what the Bible calls iniquity. The Bible tells us that the iniquities of the fathers are visited upon the children uh, for many generations. So, uh, it, you know, and I had this thought as we was talking about this, if literally everything we do and every decision we make is encoded within our epigenetic structure. If the father, when we're judged, if he could like pull out a flash drive and stick it in yeah. and well, there's everything you've done. Cause we know the Lord knows he sees everything we do, but it's like, this is just a thought that, you know, he does know, yeah, you know, he, he does, does know. know. And he has archangels that keep watch over the churches. You know, we have these yeah. these archangels that the Bible talks about, the seven spirits of the seven churches that yeah. that go and, and and collect collect information for God. They pass it to him. I mean, this is a reality of the yeah. scripture. So 
Anyways, we'll move on to this. This is uh, this is goes right into what we're talking about here. Why don't we live forever? You know, this is a, the scientists want to know why we don't live forever. They want to do literally everything that they can to make the possibility for us to live forever because they believe that is a flaw in our genetics because um, living forever um, is, is definitely a, a, something that can be found in the DNA structure. It's something that they believe they can change in the DNA structure. And uh, Genesis, in Genesis chapter 3, verses 4 through 5, you have this first instance of, of being changing people by their actions, changing people by the things they do, by sin, by disobeying one of the laws of the Creator. The epigenetics of Adam and Eve were changed, and their epigenetics were passed down from generation to generation. And um, this is what it says. It says, And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Uh, the serpent told the woman that you're not going to die. This is, this is you're going to do this, you're going to do this, and everything's going to be five. You're going to be just like God. You're going to be able to create your own existence. You're going to be able to do these things. Uh, but instead, the epigenetics curse that was put on us has continued uh, throughout uh, mankind. And in Matthew 13, 24 through 25, it says, um, Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which soweth good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. And we see this happen. Uh, you know, this 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 is a interesting parable. If you read the whole thing, I, I suggest it. But we see this, you know, several resets that happened throughout history. We see the the flood that happened that reset humanity. Only Noah and his family were righteous in his generations, and God sent a flood to wipe out all of the evil seed. And then Babylon, he he made an attempt to keep people from uh, attaining, um, going to his throne, and and being able to take him out right and to exalt themselves the bible talks about you know the one that tries to exalt himself above the throne of god we, he takes away this ability by splitting up the languages and here we are right now at a point to where uh technology has led us down a path that we are very very close to being able to uh create alternate realities that are undistinguishable from the reality that we live in and um, this is, you know, I keep track of VR because I, I think it's interesting to see the, the technology. And on one of the VR channels that I t take care of or take care of that I watch, it has uh, a video talking about the new contacts. There, there's contacts that you can put into your eye and it acts as your, your goggles so that there's less of a response of not knowing you're there. Because if you have goggles on, you can feel them on your head. There's things about the goggles that, that you know, have issues. But we have that. We have programmers that can program some of the best things in the world. You have games that are able to be programmed like a real life. And the further you go with the game, the more interaction you get because it's just a constant game kind of creating itself as you go type thing. Um, the only thing we're missing is the computers that can handle that kind of activity. But if we look at computers that we had 10 years ago versus the computers have now, the exponential growth of the ability to have these uh, these things, I mean, we can get a, easily you can get a cheap cheap now a terabyte you know a terabyte hard drive to put to put information on. And I remember back in the 90s, this would have been like a miracle to think that this is possible. You were we were running on megs, you know, not not terabytes you weren't you weren't even running on gigs yet and and we see that kind of activity being uh happening and and so we're at a point here we're at a point to where either man will achieve or man will be shut down once again and do you have anything to comment on that david but uh, you know it's frightening uh it's like science fiction becoming science reality and uh it's like it says of the tower of babel uh whatever they imagined is possible to them and that's and that's exactly what, what we're what i believe as well and so we see this kind of in this reality we have this this thing that happened we have this uh, introduction to an of iniquity to mankind uh, we also have a genetic manipulation introduction that happened in genesis chapter six and uh, it talks about it in in several different locations in fact um let me put this up on here. In fact, in Genesis 6, we have it in Enoch 6, we have in Leviticus 16 that talks about the scapegoat, the, the ritual that continued to speak of uh, the scapegoat, which in, in the uh, Hebrew is um, Azazel, which is the, the being that all the sins of the world were cast upon in Enoch chapter 6. 
uh, because of this genetic manipulation that happened when the sons of God came down to copulate with women and produce uh, genetic nightmares. You have it in Second Baruch 52. It's what it's, it says it's one of the dark waters. It's, the, it's where all evil kind of originated from is this, this activity that happened. And you see it in Greek mythology, the gods having children with the women and uh, them creating, you know, you've got the, you've got all the little different demigods and everything along those lines. And, and basically every other major religion and mythology in the world tells the same story of a intervention that took place in humanity causing the destruction of that humanity. And if you look at it from the point of view uh, of a creator that created a reality, he created this, he created it, and you see your reality being a virus being put on your reality and things are being manipulated and, and the things that you said were good. You know, God said, I created this stuff and it was good. It was good. Man could live forever. There was everything they ever wanted. There was, you know, just this complete harmony with uh, the nature and, and Adam and Eve. And, and it was just a, uh, a, a dream come true for anybody, right? This is what this was, but there was something that manipulated uh, uh, an outside force, if you will, that actually that God created, if you think about it in that way, God created this uh, outside force to, to be able to operate inside of this, uh, this reality that we have right now. And so when we look at it like that, uh, it makes a lot more sense in my opinion so far. It says, you know, in Romans 5.12, it says, Wherefore, as by one man sin, sin entered the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. And so we see this. Um, death being passed on, this iniquity being passed on to all men and um, death being passed on to all men based on this iniquity that's passed down. And, you know, if you continue reading this, it talks about one man being able to save uh, all of mankind, which is, is another very important message in all of this, because really the hope we have, if you believe you want to believe we're in a simulation, whatever, eventually you're going to have to pay the piper, the one that created this uh, reality in that we're living in. You're going to have to pay the piper and remember that. And so you better hope that the Bible is 100% wrong. You better hope that the Bible is uh, just a bunch of malarkey and that um, none of what it says is true, I, I would I would think. And, and, if, and if you still want to believe in the, the simulation hypothesis, then you need to know what you're, what's the game you're playing. Why are you playing this game? What is the point of this game that you're in? You know, some people, I don't think a lot of people are living out what they're made to do uh, for sure. And David, do you have anything to add to that? Well, this is exactly what these people are doing. They're putting forth theory that needs faith on a part of the person to believe in it. And this is what the Bible is. We have faith in the word of God. And the true uh, reality is given in scripture that there was an incursion of fallen angels and genetic corruption into the human genome. But in the matrix, if you will, of the alternative reality, well, this was a good thing. These gods, the Roman and Greek gods, they cohabitate like bunnies and they do everything immoral, but they're gods, you see. The moral yeah. element is taken out and the false reality of the simulation is what Satan wants people to believe. Because he's the creator of the simulation. Yeah, because in order for his his um, plan to work out, we have to be void of the rules that were laid out by the creator. Yeah, and this this is one thing that people do not. That this is the worst thing for a lot of people to hear. But in in First John three four it says, "Whoever committeth sin trans, transgresseth current can't talk today transgresseth also the law." For sin is the transgression of the law, and what I wrote and here, all the people in the simulation go ah yeah I don't want to do that. The Creator <laughs> laid out a law for me to live by that'll keep me safe through this. Wow, I don't want to do that. But you know, I wrote here biblical law, the rules of life, the safe perimeter in which to operate in this world, and the measure of truth. This is what this law is, and and there's been many wise men before us, and many wise men that'll come after, uh, and I wouldn't even count myself amongst those that are great, you know, but I would say that when you figure out that the law is actually there to protect you, the law is there to uh, keep you safe within the parameters of the game, and it actually keeps you from being cursed by the virus uh, that is entering into mankind uh, through this. And this is, this is the most important aspect of it. It keeps you from being able to be uh, enthralled into 
this deception because when you follow what God says, you there will be something in His law that causes you to break it by going going along with the game. You if you if you break the law, God's law, to go along with the game of the humanity, then you're liable to find yourself taking the mark of the beast. Because understand, the great accuser would love to know everything about you, to love to see your DNA and be able to keep track of not only everything that you that you've said, but your thoughts. He could keep track of all of that. How great would he love to set himself up in the throne? We, we brought forth in the last uh, midnight ride that we talked about, David. You brought this forth and we brought forth it uh, who knows how many times over the last four years that our body is the temple. He wants to sit himself yeah. in the temple. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And so kind of, um, I guess, to go forth in this, we're going to talk about iniquity. I want to want to show you that biblically iniquity is defined and and there's many many scriptures i could have used david talked about it just a second ago but this is uh important important i think to understand in our in the way we view ourselves in general you know david asked to be forgiven of his sins and he asked to be cleansed of his iniquity now what is iniquity and we we can kind of see the context here in exodus in exodus 25 it says thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them for I, the Lord thy God, am jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. In Exodus 34, 7, it says, Keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers, visiting the, let me, let me say that one more time, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children, Unto the third and fourth generation. So not only does that original sin bear with us, but we also have sin that takes forth, that comes forth, that it will visit it onto the third and fourth generation based on our epigenetics, our actions that we have uh, recorded into our DNA. And you talked a little bit earlier too, David, about rituals. Rituals can rituals. I got a question for you: Can a ritual that someone would do in the occult and magic change their DNA? Absolutely, it could. And one of the most toxic iniquities is idolatry. And this is so emphasized in the scripture, right in these texts. Don't bow down yourself to them, nor serve them. For I'm a jealous God, and he threatens. I mean, this is not the Ten Suggestions. This is the Ten Commandments that this will happen. And absolutely, you can change your genetics at a germline level through doing things in the occult, and you can literally go to the place where you become a total reprobate and put yourself beyond the veil. So this is nothing to play with. Yeah, and I think Romans kind of lines that out really good. You know, the people that that chose to worship the creation rather than creator, they uh, didn't see fit to honor God. They didn't see fit to, to give honor. I mean, give honor to the one that created what we have going on here. Well, you think it's you can think it's a simulation all you want, but whoever created this, what we're in right now, his ways are way higher than your ways, buddy. Way higher. You can't you can't even fathom his ways. Give honor and respect to where honor is due, because like David said, you will be given up to a reprobate mind if, if you haven't been already. Um, and and so, anyways, moving moving on. There is there, there is hope to all of this. There is a a thing that God put in place that he would save his people from this thing that we have going on here. And, and he, he says it so well in uh, John three sixteen through 21. A lot of people know, know this scripture and have, have read it many, many times. But when you think of it in the context of the creator uh, being in a different reality, man not being able to really see him, you know, unless they're dead, and man not being able to um, encounter God the way that they could encounter the Spirit or uh, anything else. But they, he sends his Son, right? The, in John three sixteen through 21, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he had not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. 
For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth, or he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. And and believe this that your deeds will be made manifest, my deeds will be made manifest, and that's not something that really uh, that really excites me about all the deeds that I've done in my past, right? That's not something that really excites me. But God knows it all; He knows it all. But He gave us a way out because none of us uh, were able to to content go with His law at one time. We were not able, but we have now. We have this uh, way out, right? He gives us this ability to be able to be called the sons of God, the ability to be forgiven, the ability to have our um, new system upload, I guess, if you will, right? Yeah. We get our new system upload. We get our new uh, DNA. We get our chance to rise up and live again, to be freed from this virus that was bestowed upon us. And now um, the scientists would say that that change comes when we can figure out how to get rid of the the, the uh, thing that causes people to die. But uh, the hope that we have given by the creator of this reality is the son of god he sent his only son of the only son of god into the world and um i think that's a beautiful thing to think of and to to comprehend and just to be able to be thankful and to be uh knowledgeable that you have a god that that knows everything about you he knows and when you make petitions to him he knows because it's encoded into that structure that he's given it's encoded you're you're create you're asking god you're saying you're creating a petition. Help me save my program. You know something's wrong here. There's something wrong. And to those that he loves, he he reaches he reaches to and he does does things for. And it's a beautiful thing. And you know and it's that's why it's important to follow his his laws. The Bible says that I he your, the prayers are an abomination to people that that don't want to even hear my law. They won't even hear it. Their their prayers are an abomination. So we don't want that to happen. We want to keep in contact with our Creator because things are coming upon the earth that it would be great. To be um, one of those little little guys that had God on his corner, right? It would be great. Yeah. You know, when we think about God knowing everything we've done, and the Bible says that we will give account for all of our deeds before the Lord. Now, only through, and of course, we've talked about the idea that through doing evil, you can change your genetics through the epigenetics, but also through coming to Christ, you can change yourself at a germline genetic level. Uh, Titus 3 and 5 says, uh, and I just moved my finger and I got the <laughs> one wrong verse. Wouldn't you know that I would do that? Uh, that Ain't was, I silly? But was. I'll find it here. Titus chapter 3 and verse 5. The scripture says, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration. Literally being regened. We're washed. Our genetics are washed. The washing of regeneration and renewing in the Holy Ghost. And 2 Corinthians 5.17, one of the most familiar scriptures, in the Bible, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. We get new desires. We get new goals. We get a desire to do good and not bad. We're changed. Yeah. And that change goes all the way to our genetics. And that change could not happen within us without changing our genetics. Man, so profound. It, you know, it calls to mind Hebrews eight twelve uh, that talks about him being merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities. Will I remember no more? Yeah, I'll remember them no more. Yeah, that's an, that's that is a, a blessing to because there's nobody out there. I don't care if you want to say this publicly to anybody or not, but the fact remains you have things that you're not proud of. Everything's being recorded. You have things that you don't want God to see. Let's oh, just yeah. put it that way. Uh, we have that, but thankfully we have a redemption, man. It's just a, it's just an amazing thing. I, I hope that people can find hope in this, especially in the time we're living in now, because right now things are so uncertain. But when you really, truly believe that the Creator, you have access to Him and He has access to you, these things of the world become dim, right? They become things that don't really scare you nor matter as much because you look at those things 
in in the light of being under the wing of the creator of everything this is this this is a not only is it encouraging, right? Not only is it encouraging, but um, it is also the most logical explanation, not not just logical by science terms, but by any terms. This is the most, uh, the thing that makes the most sense, no matter how you, what you want to believe, you know? Yeah. And we could think about it like this. If you knew that you were going to die tonight, and that you were going to have to stand before God and give an account for everything you've done. And I guarantee you we've all done some stuff we don't want God bringing up to us. If you had a chance to get out of that, to where those things would not be held against you, would you take that? You would be absolutely a fool not to. And this is the reality we all have that chance in Christ. We don't know when we're going to die. And we can, by coming to the cross and putting our sins under the blood, we can have that wiped out to where uh, that won't be held against us. And I remember a chick comic book. And this chick comic book was about the last judgment. And there at the last judgment, it had everybody there like at a drive-in theater. Oh, man. And like they showed your life and everything you did on the movie screen there at the drive-in theater. Yeah, how and, humbling, right? Whoa, boy. Uh, you know, so we have that chance. There's, We need to come to Christ and come to Christ now. Repent and believe the gospel and have those sins put away as far as the east is from the west. And, and I'll echo what, what uh, King David said. You know, I've never seen the righteous um, put to shame. You know, I've never seen them put... Like, what did he say Or a exactly? seed begging bread. The, seed. I've never seen the righteous forsaken or a seed begging bread. That's it. And, and that is something that I would I would, would uh, second on that, on that. Because this is what he has lined out for us. The, the world is going to tell you that it's foolishness. The world is going to tell you don't do that. Even the church is going to demonize uh, the idea of following the the guidelines that God put out. They're going to demonize this. Uh, they have already, and it'll get worse over time. But um, to know that that is our um, protection through a lot of this stuff. I mean, because if you know, it, there's going to be things that come and try to invade your body. But if you know your body is the temple, and you know, like this, there's certain things that God says don't put in your body. A lot of all of these things will come with abominations, and and if you already are no knowledge of what what you're supposed to do and not supposed to do, you're not going to be tricked. You know, they're not there. You can't be tricked when you decide to follow what God tells you to do. There's two basic things I bring to the table when I study all of Scripture and especially God's law. Is number one, He knows a lot more than I do. Yes. And number two, He loves me, yeah. and He has my best interest at heart. So I just try to go along. <laughs> Yeah. I just try to go along with him. He knows more than I do and loves me. So if I can just go along with him, I'm going to be blessed for it. Yes, yes, exactly. And we re- we remember, we know that there has to be there has to be a reset. There has to be the, the the reset that we've all been longing for. And I'm not talking about the great reset that the world's talking about. I'm talking about the real great reset when he comes and he cleanses the world of all unrighteousness, wipes away every tear from our eyes, and um, brings the good in the world and gets rid of the evil and i stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast 